Thank you very much, Laura, for impromptu moderating. Um, hello to my parents on Zoom. Hello to my friends from, it looks like, Peru and Puerto Rico and Wash U and Emory and Northwell and Wake Forest and, 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 um, and around the country. So thank you. Oh, somebody waving, but I can't see who you are. But, um, but you're giving me the thumbs up, but I have no idea who you are. Um, so I don't have a moderator, so I could talk as long as I want to, which is pretty sweet. Um, Laura's telling me no. Uh, so my disclosures are listed here, and my disclosures have literally nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about, so I'm not going to keep them on the slide at all. Um, and my disclosure number two, so this is the Distinguished Investigator Award talk, and I'm not going to talk about my research at all, um, except for very indirectly. Um, so again, I'm going to talk about where I got from to how I got here, because a lot of people ask me, how do you get here? And in theory, I'm talking to a bunch of people who aren't already accomplished scientists, although like literally everybody I'm looking at is an accomplished scientist. Nonetheless, I'm going to pretend that I'm talking to a group that aren't. Um, so many people know from an early age what they're destined to do. I'm looking at Tim Buckman in the second row, who I think when he was in kindergarten already knew he was going to be working for BARDA and doing machine learning. Um, I did not. Um, so here are some lessons I learned along the way that led me to where I am today. So. Some of you have seen this picture, some of you have not. But back in high school, I looked like this. Okay, everybody can figure out which one is me? Everybody think about it? Gloria's pointing, yeah, a lot of people are pointing. I'm the second one from the right. Uh, blue shirt, cool sunglasses. You could, might argue I'm looking really super good there. Um, at that age, and that was I was a senior in high school, um, I knew that I wanted to be a surgeon, not an intensivist, a surgeon. Um, so lessons learned from being a Hawaiian shirt nerd, and this is back in 1983. Having a plan matters. The plan might change over time, self-evident, but having the vision to chart your own course is important. What you think looks good on you might actually look ridiculous years later, um, and yet you might actually see me wearing that again. That's a teaser for you guys to wait around for the whole talk. Um, at that stage in life, I'd literally never heard of critical care, and I had zero desire to do research. I know there are people now who start doing research in high school and in college, and my daughter's listening on Zoom, and she's in a lab at college right now. I am not one of those people. Um, again, people start doing research in college. I didn't. I edited the Daily Pennsylvania. This is me. Um, people like the perm? Cool look? Everybody? Yeah? Awesome look? Yeah, you can't hear mom and dad, but yeah, people are loving the perm look. Absolutely loving it. Um, so. The Daily Pennsylvania was actually named the best college newspaper in the country. And here were some unexpected lessons learned from what I'll call the DP part one. Um, I learned how to work as part of a team. And I ultimately learned how to lead a team as an editor. I learned how to write. And I learned how to write rapidly. I wrote over 150 stories, always with a deadline, basically the same night. This should sound sort of similar to what we have to do as scientists. I learned to write clearly. I learned how to write concisely. And even though I couldn't have articulated any of it when I was 20 years old, every one of those skills will become foundational to my future career. These are some of the people I worked with at the DP. Again, this is 1986 or so. Um, Jeff Goldberg is currently the editor-in-chief of the Atlantic Magazine. You might see him on Meet the Press. We shared an office together. Um, Gene Sperling was one of my columnists. He's the director of the economic policy for the, both the Clinton and the Obama White Houses. Um, and Ken Rosenthal, for those who follow baseball, you'll see him on Fox News as a sideline reporter. Um, this is something that somebody sent me, I don't get the Atlantic, but somebody sent me, again, from the editor-in-chief of the Atlantic, talking about the, um, the head of the Obama White House and Clinton White House for economics. And you see in the middle, the editorial page editor, and all of a sudden I'm name-checked. And I had no idea, I don't read the Atlantic, and somebody sent this to me um, a zillion years after we were all sharing an office together in college. So what are some unexpected lessons part two? Um, you have no idea who's sitting next to you at any time and what their destiny is going to be. And the only difference between the, the most accomplished people in the fields and those who aspire to similar careers is age. So anybody, if we have any trainees in here, you're going to be exactly the same as the senior ones of us in 20 years. You just get older, another generation goes, you come on, and the people who are working in college and labs right now, they're gonna be the ones up here in 20 years from now. So I went to medical school at Penn and I looked like this. Again, I think everybody will appreciate the hair and the guitar. I'm not the tall one, shock you, but it's true. Um, I was asked to take call in my surgery rotation. This is a true story, and anybody know how I responded? Maybe some people have heard the story. 
true story. I was asked to take call as a medical student on surgery, what I was going into, and I said, no thanks, I have a gig. I, would, I can't even imagine if somebody said that to me. But that's a direct verbatim quote from me. So lessons learned from medical school. Sometimes you can do things that are unbelievably, unbelievably stupid, and it does not have to define you. Learn from it, help others learn from it. Does anybody know how long it should take to get from Philadelphia to St. Louis? Tim says eight hours. Um, by plane, it should take like an hour, two hours. Um, so it should take a couple of hours, but if it takes more than 12 hours, it can change your life. So I was going from Philly, I didn't have enough money, so I, had a, a, I was going through Memphis to, to St. Louis on flight. I missed the last flight, and so I had to drive. I called up the people I was staying with, they were interns, I'm like, how do I get there? They're like, you go through Highway 40. It turns out what's called Highway 40 in St. Louis is actually Interstate 64, um, and there actually is an Interstate 40 out of Memphis that goes towards Little Rock. So I got on what they told me to do, I went two hours the wrong direction, I was like, how do I get to St. Louis? They're like, you drive two hours back to Memphis and then you drive north. And then I tried to get off the highway, they told me to get off, there was only one exit um, in the wrong direction. So I was an hour past St. Louis, I'm like, how do you get back to Barnes Jewish Hospital, they come back this way. So I spent like 12 hours driving to get there and got there in no sleep. And ultimately my boards and my, you know, people are like, oh, you must be so smart, you trained at Wash U. No, Tim Buckman is so smart, he got recruited to Wash U. I was able to stay up all night. Um, my grades and board scores were not good enough to match at Wash U. And remember, I was in a band called Go Dog Go, and I chose to do a gig there rather than take call. I should not have matched at Wash U. And I'm 100% convinced to this day that I matched at Wash U because I was up all night and I still managed to be coherent in an interview in a day that it was every other night call and surgery. So lessons from a crazy road trip. Life does throw unexpected obstacles at you. You can complain, you can give up, you can get angry, or you can take it as an opportunity. I'm literally standing here because I matched at Wash U. If not, everything in my life, literally everything in my life would be different. Serendipity. I started my residency with the clear expectation of becoming a full-time operative surgical oncologist, not even a question. I went into the lab because it was mandatory. I'd never been in the lab in my life, and I told my chair I wanted to be interested. I was interested in cancer. And so I wanted to either work on colon cancer or breast cancer. So this is my first chair, Sam Wells. Um, and he gave me two choices, a lab that studied gut stuff, not cancer. He was a chair of molecular biology and pharmacology. He'd taken one surgeon, he had a 25 person lab. Um, he thought surgeons were stupid. He told me he thought surgeons were stupid and he mandated a three year commitment, but he published in really good journals. The other one was a first year faculty member who was starting their lab, had never had anybody in there. Anybody know which one I took? I took number one. Um, and this is Jeff Gordon because number two, it worked out really well because she went to private practice one year later. Um, so it turned out I chose well. This is Jeff Gordon, um, who was the first lab, and the first two years in the lab, I accomplished literally nothing. Not sort of nothing, literally nothing. My project was such a bust because I found out that the mice that I thought I had weren't actually the mice that I had. So it wasn't like it was negative data, it was literally, literally worthless. Two years down the train. And so my chair actually threatened to fire me. Um, it was an old day, there weren't program directors. Um, so there's serendipity, opportunity, despair, and some degree of redemption. I was such a bust that my, the PI was like, I don't care what you do, do whatever you want. Somebody else is paying you, you're on a training grant, do whatever you want. And then all of a sudden everything clicked. And I ended up with multiple first author papers. And three years after he threatened to fire me, I won the first inaugural Sam Wells resident research competition. I ended up running it. Um, so lessons from my lab time and residency. Put yourself in a situation that you believe optimizes your chances of success. Work really hard, and even if you do that, things often don't go as planned. Turn mass of failure, and I was the definition of mass of failure, into something else. Often others will lose faith in you. Do not lose faith in yourself. Finally, more serendipity. When I became a senior resident, I switched into critical care. My mouse model that I had just made that I talked about literally had no phenotype at all. The mice never developed cancer. And so my mentor was totally uninterested in the animals. He's like, yeah, do whatever you want. Nobody gives their intellectual treat, you know, thing to their postdoc. He's like, yeah, I don't care. Have it all. And then I have the best mentors ever. Left scientific mentor Richard Hotchkiss, right sitting in the second row, best mentor of everything in the life, scientifically, life, career, everything, Tim Buckman. More serendipity. The NIH budgeted right when I was doubled right when I was applying for my first grant. Tim told me when I was a fellow, you should apply for a grant. I was like, yeah, sure, I should apply for a grant because Tim Buckman told me to. Having no concept that applying for a fellow by an NIH grant is ridiculous. Um, and I was funded for a K08 that I wrote as a fellow. And so started a day one on faculty with an NIH grant using the mice that were totally worthless from before.
Tim told me I should apply for an R01 two years later. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, you should do that. And I got funded on that. And then he told me I should apply for another one. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, you should do that. And I was like, okay. Um, so not understanding how ridiculous that it sounded, within three years or four years of faculty, I had three NIH grants. So lessons learned from my fellowship and first years of faculty, luck does play a role, a huge role. Always remember that fact and be humble to understand that a random series of events might just happen to fall into place for you. So much in my life would have been so different if not for blind luck. Having said that, your success is due to many others taking the time to develop your career. I'm incredibly indebted to my mentors and I'm incredibly blessed to have many of them in the room. I'm looking around, I'm seeing Tim Buckman, I'm seeing Cliff Deutschman, I'm seeing so many people who play such a role in my life and believe that essentially every successful faculty person here feels the same or should feel the same. Seek out the best mentorship possible and choose wisely. So starting a lab, for better or for worse, I never performed a single experiment in my lab, even though I can still look at a microscope. The people I work with determined my success every bit as much as my intellectual thing. So I had three lab managers at WashU over the last nine, over nine years. It's the one on the left, the one wearing the baseball hat, and the woman on the right. None of them wanted to be a lab manager. And one of them is now, went to medical school as the emergency medicine, clerkship director, Virginia Tech. Two of them became surgical PAs. I worked with a lot of residents and students at WashU, and it's possible that Lynn Shalom, as you're looking, you recognize some of these people. Um, these are their first jobs. It doesn't matter who they all are, although I'll point out that the third person here I had lunch with yesterday. Um, these are their first jobs, and what you'll notice some of them went into critical care, and some of them had nothing to do with critical care, ENT, pediatric anesthesiology, endocrine surgery. So what are lessons I learned there? I work with people who are ambitious. I work with people who worked as hard as I did or harder than I do. I work with people who I actually liked, even if they didn't want to do the same thing as me. The goal is not that they do this to be the best me, the goal is that they become the best them. And then I came to Emory in 2009. I came to Emory because of the critical care center. And I was tremendously afraid of what would happen if I lost contact side by side with my, my scientific mentor, Dr. Hotchkiss. And I needed to work with the immunologist for a simple project and I asked Alan Kirk, who was then the vice chair of research and is now the chair of surgery at Duke, uh, for a recommendation where Paul Wishmeyer is. Um, and he suggested Mandy Ford. You'll see at the bottom, this is in fact an old picture of me. I was 30 pounds lighter and I didn't have gray hair, but this is the only picture I have of Mandy and me. Um, Mandy is a PhD immunologist. She had literally, literally never heard of sepsis. When I said to her, do you know what sepsis is? She's like, nope. Um, within a couple of years of meeting each other, of her saying, I've never heard of sepsis, we had a pilot grant and we had an R01 together. Lessons learned. Seek out collaborations from people who have no idea, literally no idea what you're doing. I've never heard of sepsis. Even if on the surface, they don't make any sense. Be enthusiastic. Keep an open mind for people who are new to your field will see things in new ways that you don't. When I first talked to Alan Kirk, he said to me, you sepsis people are stupid. He denied saying this, but he did. And I was like, why are we sepsis people stupid? He's like, because we modulate the immune system every single day in transplant, why don't you do that? And I was like, that's a good question. Um, and I never thought about that because I was in the, my bubble. So talking to people who see things totally differently brings you to new ways. Work with people who are smarter than you. There's credit to go around and everybody wins. So I was at the top of the world and then not. I knew in 2011 that I was gonna become president of SCCM in 2015. Multiple SCCM presidents, unfortunately before me, left their jobs after the presidency. One of them lost their funding when they were done. They thought they were a researcher. Their chair thought they were a clinician. It was like, well, you don't have any funding. I'm taking away your lab. Um, and so my goal, knowing that when I was president, was I wanted to have two R01s, knowing I needed at least one. So Mandy and I applied for every cycle to the NIH with the goal of having one grant and hopefully two. And when I was SCCM president, I was PI, co-PI, and five NIH grants. Um, so what's the lesson learned from that? Apply, and, apply, and, apply, and, apply. For the baseball fans, you don't hit the pitch you don't swing at. So who does the work? This is actually my current lab. Um, the top two are my current lab, um, both at a Mexican restaurant and last year at the Shock Society. Um, lessons learned. The people I work with at Emory are awesome. The surgery residents are awesome. The PhD students are awesome. The international visiting scholars are awesome. Um, my lab manager is awesome. The people you work with define your research, as well as the culture, the environment, and the enjoyment of life as a clinician scientist. So to come full circle, and I'm just about done, and thank you for not really having a moderator. Thank you, Laura Evans, because I'm sure I'm a couple of minutes over. Um, the last time SCCM was in Hawaii, I was at the same session as two surgeon scientists. People might know John Olverde and Rob Sawyer. Um, they published respectively in, um, well, actually it's backwards. They published respectively in Science in the New England Journal. 
there was obviously no way I could outscience them because I don't publish. I publish in OK journals, but I'm not like that level. Um, so it seemed appropriate that we were in Hawaii to return to my high school attire. Um, so here's me at the podium in Hawaii. Um, and you'll see Rob and John, then you'll see the picture that I showed you before of the high school thing. You'll actually see me wearing the same Hawaiian shirt from high school. But in case you don't believe me, I'll blow it up. Seriously, wearing the exact same shirt that I wore in high school. So what are lessons learned along the way? The success as a clinician scientist has been a mix of inquisitiveness, serendipity, amazing mentors. Again, I will say here personally, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you, many, many other people in the room opportunities, outstanding collaborators, outstanding residents and scholars in the lab from around the world with whom to partner, a willingness to work at least reasonably hard, and ultimately having fun. And with that, I will say thank you guys so much. And hi, Mom and Dad. Thank you, Craig, for sharing your journey with us. And uh, I think you are probably the embodiment of somebody who loves their work and has a enormous fun while doing it and is an inspiration to all of us. So thank you. Um, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Paul Wishmeyer, who's a Discovery Grant Award recipient this year for uh, remotely monitored mobile health high intensity interval training after critical care. Welcome, and thanks for coming. So on a personal note, Craig, it's been a joy to have spent the last 20 years growing up together. And, and, and there's mentors of mine in this room. Cliff was my first R1 reviewer, and, and, and Tim has been someone I've wanted to emulate and look up to for many, many years. So we are really, really lucky to have these mentors. So this was a grant that, that we wrote during the midst of COVID. Um, mainly, I will honestly tell you, to work with Wes. Wes and I really want to train that guy, Matthew Mart, who unfortunately isn't here today, but he is a new scientific, uh, new uh, clinician scientist at Vanderbilt, who is who's a name you're going to hear a lot of, I think, soon in this field. So um, these are my alignments of interest. Some of them do have to do with things I'm going to tell you, but I'd like to believe we're all on the same page, whether it's the NIH, whether it's the industry sponsors or the DOD. I think we all want to make people better. So as I always say, we want to take responsibility not just for what happens in the ICU, but what happens after the ICU as well. And I think that needs to be as much a part of our rounds as the things we do every day in the ICU, because ultimately creating survivors and not victims is the ultimate goal of all of our care every day. Because really what our patients want, of course, is to be able to walk down the street with the people they love again when they get home and hold their grandchildren. And, and my passion for research focuses around my own personal experience as a patient and, and wanting this for myself as well. And, and it's what led me to do what I do. So the question I've always asked to my residents and my medical students is every day when we do things, are we creating survivors or are we creating victims? Because of course we know from Margaret Heritage's work and others that a large number of our patients have significant impairments that go on for years, if not a lifetime. And so we need to be better at this. And COVID-19 has only made this worse. And you're going to be talking about a focus this, this trial is going to take on in COVID-19 in a moment. So I'm not going to belabor the data. You know the data. We know that even patients who are not in the ICU, who are not hospitalized, have significant long-term physical impairments. And so we need to be better for them and for all of our ICU patients. But how can we do that? Of course, it's going to take a combination of a lot of things, good care in the ICU, therapeutic nutrition, good PT, and then I'm going to show you some learnings from elite Olympic athletes that we are implementing in this trial. And the key thing here is one size exercise or nutrition or care doesn't fit all. And I think this is one of the things that, that we are learning more and more that personalization of care has to be more advanced than it's ever been before if we're going to make a dent in this and not have outcome lines in the control and experimental group that always overlap. So again, right dose, right patient, right time, and exercise can be titrated and personalized as nutrition can be as well. It's a different talk for a different day. But this can be personalized, and we're going to talk about that. Um, I, John Louis asked me to write a, an, or have edit an issue on this, and I wrote the editorial saying, look, if we can't measure it, we can't improve it. And I'm going to show you that this is true for exercise, as it is for everything else in critical care medicine. And if it's not measurable, find a way to make it so. In this case, athletes are great at measuring things. I'm going to show you how we learn from athletes to do what we're doing. Um, of course, I also have the belief that it's more than just one thing that's going to make our patients better. I think anabolic agents hold a great future as well, um, and, and clearly exercise is fundamental as is nutrition and, and, and good critical care basics. So what can we learn from athletes to do better for our patients and help them recover? Exercise after the ICU and after COVID can't look like this. It needs to look like this. 
only, only doable in a patient room, and that's where we're going. And so there's a lot of things. This is CPET testing, cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Um, it's what Olympic athletes do to train. It's what professional athletes do to train. And it's what we're now doing for ICU patients and post-COVID patients to train. Um, if you want to read a lot about it, these are the people that know more about it than I'll ever know about it. Um, John Whittle was a trainee of mine who's now back with Mervyn Singer, who was his mentor before me um, in, in, in the UK, and Inigo Zambalan, who was the team coach for Garmin for the Tour de France for 20 years, and is now the UAE team coach. His athlete just won the Tour de France. These are the people that taught me about CPAP. So this is a reality. We are doing this in surgery. Um, this is just quick data to show you what it looks like when you do it on a bike in surgery. Um, this is John and Yaron Mullinger, who also is a better exercise physiologist than anyone I know in the world for critical care patients. We were lucky enough to get him at Duke. Um, this is one of the patients we train to preoperatively optimize someone for surgery. Her name was Michelle. Bladder cancer. She'd been turned down at three other centers. She came to Duke, and she said, I really want to have this surgery. Um, and, and no one will operate on me because I can't even get out of my chair. I'm too weak, I'm too frail. But I want to do what it takes. And so what we do is we sit up on a bike, we measure their VO2 peak, we measure their heart rate with their VO2 peak, we generate a high intensity training program with heart rates targeted to her ability, we put a card into a bike and she comes in twice a week, three times a week and she does that. We give them nutrition as well. Um, in four weeks, we put 1.5 kilos of lean body mass on her legs alone. This is a BIA device to measure that with. People who are very unfit make huge gains to become fit versus people who are very fit are very hard to nudge up their gains. This has been a miraculous discovery for me to watch very unfit people make massive gains. Most have never exercised in their life. But we're doing it in a targeted, personalized way. She improved in four weeks a whole measured exercise tolerance unit, which is a massive increase in VO2 peak. Um, and this is in one month. Um, if she can sustain that for her lifetime, that's a 15% mortality risk for her lifetime, just that. And I haven't had a patient that's run through this protocol that doesn't want to exercise after surgery. She ultimately had surgery, was out of the hospital in six days. So the problem is, this is very hard to do in a hospital room with a COVID patient or an ICU patient. They're even more unfit. So we need to do something they can do standing in place. I'm going to show you me doing it. I'm not a great example probably of that. But patients can do this too. All we ask them to do is step in place, and so this is a solution. This was the grant we applied for because we wanted to see if we could do this in patients, um, and we are really grateful to SCCM, as I'll show in a moment. But what we do is we, we do this testing, we create a personalized exercise plan, we give them an iPhone and an iWatch, they go home with it, and they work with the medical ICU physical therapists as their coaches twice a week over this iPhone. So thank you for SCCM for giving this award to us. Um, we couldn't have done this without it. And ultimately, it led to Wes and I putting together with Amy Pastava, a PhD physical therapist at Duke, who again knows more about exercise than I will ever, ever know. Um, we submitted an R1. I think I wrote more grants during COVID than I'd written in the last 15 years of my life combined. Um, this was one of them, and it was funded. So for, for Center, because of discovery, this happened. So. And Matt Mart, our trainee, is a prominent person on this grant. So this has got a lot of young trainees in it. These are all the people involved in it that, that make this possible. Um, again, Amy Pasto makes this completely possible. She's an NIH-funded physical therapist. Um, but there's many people on this list, people names you'll know. Nate Brummel is a trainee of Wes. Uh, Pete Morris, who's a, a maven in exercise um, in recovery, rehab, and critical care. And the people on the bottom are, are some of the experts who really are making this happen on the ground. And then we are partnered with the Sib Center at Vanderbilt, which is an amazing center. If you don't know about it, you should read about it. Go look up it online. They, they do amazing things for critical care survivors. This is what the, the grant looked like. This is the main figure from the grant. Um, basically, we take people in after COVID hospitalization um, or in the ICU. We test them. We have them exercise for three months. We bring them back. We do a CPET test, VO2 peaks, the primary endpoint, and then we do fall, bone follow-up at six months. We're, we have some non-invasive mitochondrial metabolism we're doing PBMC-based mitochondrial draws as well. This is our flyer, this is what we give the patients, so I'll take you quickly through the study. Um, 140 participants, seven in each group. One group gets this aggressive exercise three times a week, um, personalized exercise, I shouldn't call it aggressive. The other group gets tested but gets a handout and is allowed to exercise on their own. Pretty simple, if you can walk, you can be in the study. The only other key thing is you can't be on HOMO2 because we can't test you on HOMO2 yet. We don't have the right kind of masks to deal with people that are on O2 when we're testing them. So we need to get them off their oxygen first. We have a month to test them when they're discharged. So we wait to get them off oxygen and then we test them. Um, we take them and we do an evaluation and training with the ones, especially that randomize in. 
we do a lot of things. I won't belabor what we do, but we test all the key things that all good um, physical function tests and good critical care tests should do in long-term outcomes, um, as Dale Needham has taught us. Um, our study procedures include a range of things, including a muscle-specific ultrasound test, and the incremental step test is the key. This is what it looks like when we do it. The patients don't move quite so fast, um, but, but this is what I, I had some pretty big surgeries when in the ICU over a week, intubated myself last spring in April. This is me the week before surgery getting tested because I was the first subject um, to go through the practice protocol. So, and this is the data that it generates. That flat part of the curve there is where we take the heart rate. We use that heart rate, I will show you, to generate the uh, low intensity and high intensity exercise. This is where the physical therapists do all the work. Um, this is a well-documented protocol that's been used for years in professional athletes and, and, and in rehabilitation studies. And this is how we do it. And we have a low and a high intensity, and then, let me get to the next one, and then we give them a prescription. And then they go up and down for a minute like this, three times a week, and they get coached by a physical therapist twice a week to make sure they're doing it right. We can see their heart rates all the time. They wear their eye watched all the time during the day. And so you can see we have various intervals. We do a lot of different um, functional testing. If you're curious the things we do or want to do this yourself, these are the tests we do. The SPB is fundamental, um, as is some of the sit-to-stand and six-minute walk test is our main secondary outcome. We do muscle sound, we do a lot of muscle analysis. This gives you muscle mass, muscle glycogen, and, and a lot of other information that, that is really unique. Um, this is your own doing this on me. Um, you have to have really good people to do this with. As Craig said, the people around me are much smarter and better than I am. You need an assessor who can do these tests. We've taught people at all the other centers to do it. Nate Brummel's group starts next week at Ohio State. And you need a PT, usually one of our ICU PTs, to connect to the patients. It's neat, we get continuity of care with a lot of these patients all the way into the home. It's like they have their own personal trainer, um, but it's somebody they have to know. Um, again, there's an intervention in a control group. The intervention looks a lot like this. Um, often they overshoot their heart rates in the first period of time, so we have to coach them. They also do strength and balance. I won't go through all these, but this is what it looks like. We teach them to do it. This is actually the patient handout. We have videos for these as well. Sit to stand, stand to squat, lateral lunges, single legs, deadlifts. These are all the things we teach them to do, and they progress, some of them very slowly, of course. They progress through these calf raises, things like that. We do mobility. Um, these are all the things patients are taught in their first session. We do balance. We have these kinds of progressions. These are what our patients look like as they progress their interval times and the number they do get longer as they move through and the physical therapists bring them forward with it. Does it work? I, I have to a lot of credit. This is uh, Tony Sung. He is our really premier BMT physician at Duke. He's heavily R1 funded. He actually developed this idea with some of the physical therapists that I'm working with for cancer BMT patients, for pre-BMT. Um, he's done a bunch of patients at this point. This was the prelim data from the grant. Um, we get actually the people to exercise more than we ask them to. They adhere 117% of what we ask them to do. You can bump their VO2 25% in four weeks. And these are in very debilitated cancer patients. They have the average VO2 peak of an ARDS survival, I will tell you, looking at data from both groups. So these are some papers if you want to learn more about some of these different things that we do. Um, but in the end, as I finish, we have to train our patients like an athlete would train. We invest millions, if not billions, of dollars in critical care survivors. They should get the same kind of attention to detail in their recovery and the, getting their lives back as an athlete does. Because if we're going to create survivors and not victims, right, we have to be better than we have been because we haven't been great at it before. So we have to measure. And like we said, if we can't measure it, we have to find out how to measure it and make measure what is it. And then hopefully we can take patients to look like this, have them looking like this, and then have them move like this. Or at least like this, which is really the goal. Um, I encourage all of you to follow us on social media. We talk a lot about the different exercise things we do and the nutrition things we do. And I'm happy to, to answer questions um, by email or, or um, share these slides or anything else. Thanks. You're going to introduce the next one, but I just want to thank Paul for photoshopping his head onto my body for those pictures. <laughs> Thank you, Paul, and congratulations on both the Discovery Award and the NIH Award as well. And I don't really want to thank you for that image that's sort of permanently <laughs> seared <laughs> in all of our heads here, but it's definitely memorable. <laughs> so, um, I want to welcome our next speaker uh, to the podium, and that is Dr. Wendy Walker um, from Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. Uh, who's the recipient of one of the SCCM Weill research grants um, and will be presenting Exploring Changes in Peritoneal Macrophage Composition and Function During Sepsis. Wow. 
Wow, that's two hard acts to follow. <laughs> Well, I want to start by thanking the Society of Critical Care Medicine for giving me this opportunity to present our data and also for that funding um, that I received in the form of the SCCM Wheel Award. So, oh, actually, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to advance the slide from here. The mouse is not advancing the slide. It has a physical cord. Is anything that went wrong at Congress? Here we go. It went that time. <laughs> it was just warming up, I guess. Okay, these are <laughs> these are my learning objectives. I'm going to go straight through. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So um, you're probably aware that tissue resident macrophages exist in most tissues throughout the body, and they perform functions to maintain tissue homeostasis by clearing up dead cells through ap um, phagocytosing apoptotic cells as well as in responding to infection or tissue damage. They express pattern recognition receptors, such as the toll-like receptors that recognize HAMPs and DAMPs from pathogens and from damaged tissues and initiate an inflammatory response. So in regard to the abdominal cavity, there are two populations of tissue resident macrophages. These were identified first in mice and then in people. And the more dominant of these, the large peritoneal macrophages, comprise about 90% of the macrophages in that compartment. They're F480 high. They're very easy to identify by flow cytometry. The second population, the small peritoneal macrophages, comprise about 10% of the macrophages, and they're harder to identify because they're F480 intermediate or low, but they're also MHC2 high. Another thing is that the LPM are a self-renewing population that derives from a yolk sac progenitor, while the SPM derived from monocytes that infiltrate um, at low levels at steady state and then differentiate to give rise to these. In the context of inflammation, the situation changes dramatically. So you've probably heard of the macrophage disappearance reaction, where the LPMs seem to disappear from the peritoneal wash, although research by Paul Cubes and others has shown that they may not be dying, but may be relocating, um, for example, the sites of tissue damage where they nibble away at apoptotic cells. And at the same time, you get a massive infiltration of monocytes um, into the peritoneal cavity. Of course, other cell types such as neutrophils infiltrate too. I won't be talking about them today. These monocytes, um, in the context of sterile inflammatory insults such as zymosan and thioglycolate, within a few days they differentiate to give rise to greatly increased numbers of SPM. However, this process hasn't really been studied in the context of abdominal sepsis. And so we don't really know how, um, prior to the study that I completed, um, we had limited information about how the myeloid cells change in the peritoneal cavity during abdominal sepsis and during sterile abdominal surgery. And of course, it would be very important to identify patterns that are associated with sepsis survival versus patterns that are associated with um, death, because these could represent therapeutic targets. So to study these, we performed sequel ligation and puncture on C57 black six mice, um, including both males and females. So a surgery was performed and the cecum was exteriorized. A portion of it was ligated and it was punctured. And then the organ was returned to the abdomen and in sham surgery, the ligation and puncture was skipped. And these animals received buprenorphine SR for analgesia as well as antibiotics and lactated ringer solution. So our model followed um, the guidelines presented in the minimum quality um, thresholds in sepsis studies. And then at various time points post-surgery, the animals were euthanized, and we harvested peritoneal lavage to see what cells were present. So this shows the pipeline of flow cytometry analysis that was used to identify it. I don't really see a pointer here, so I'll have to just kind of talk you through it. On the left-hand side, you can see the cell gating and then the singlet gating. We then gated upon the CD45 positive leukocytes and then excluded some populations of non-intrast. We gated the CD11B positive myeloid cells. And then in the next box, you can see the LPM that were F480 high, MHC2 low, as well as the SPM that were F480 intermediate or low and MHC2 high. Um, and so then on the right-hand side, you can also see that there were very few Li6C high monocytes in the abdomen of a healthy mouse. So all those graphs on the top are in a naive mouse. And then on the bottom shows some um, representative um, flow cytometry analysis from a mouse 18 hours after the CLP surgery, 
And here you can see that the LPM are effectively gone from the peritoneal wash. The SPM hadn't really changed much in number, but there was this massive infiltration of monocytes. And so we quantified this. Again, I'm having a little trouble advancing the slide. Let's hope the pointer catches up or maybe, oh, there we go, okay. So you can see that in a naive mouse on the left-hand side, shown in those gray triangles, there was about one to two million LPM in the peritoneal cavity. But at 18 hours post-surgery, these were gone from the peritoneal wash and they remained pretty depleted at 66 hours. By 14 days post-surgery, they had returned to the peritoneal wash of the sham mice, but were still depleted from the abdomen of most of the CLP mice. So they go away and they stay gone for quite a while. In regard to the monocytes, you can see there are very few in the abdomen of a naive mouse. There is a massive infiltration by 18 hours post-surgery. These remain at 66 hours post-surgery. And in many of the CLP mice, there were still monocytes present at even 14 days. Um, in regard to the SPM, we thought we were going to see a dramatic increase in these by about 66 hours post-surgery. That's what we see if we inject a mouse with thioglycolate, but we instead only saw a very minor increase in the SPM at these early time points, and only at 14 days post-CLP surgery did we see a more substantial increase in the SPM. So it seems the monocytes are coming in, um, and they're sticking around, but they're not rapidly differentiating to give rise to large numbers of SPM. And then we also wanted to see the differences between animals that were destined to survive sepsis versus animals that were destined to succumb. So we stratified our cohort here based on serum IL-6, um, as has been shown by others, such as Daniel Remick. We found that we could predict whether a mouse would live or die after CLP surgery by measuring the IL-6 level at 18 hours post-surgery. In our hands, the cutoff seems to be about five nanogram per mil. All animals with a value greater than that are destined to succumb within three days post-surgery. Animals with levels lower than that will either survive or a few of them will exhibit a late death. And you can see in comparing the groups that were predicted to live versus those predicted to die, the animals predicted to live had significantly more monocytes in their peritoneal cavity. So based on this, we hypothesized that greater infiltration of monocytes into the peritoneal cavity aids sepsis survival. And we investigated this using two methods. The first was through the use of CCR2 knockout mice. These mice lack the chemokine receptor that plays a major role in recruiting monocytes um, through the action of chemokines, um, including MCP1. And indeed, you can see on the left-hand side that CCR2 knockout mice had significantly fewer monocytes in their peritoneal cavity at 18 hours post-surgery. We predicted that because of these fewer monocytes, we would see greater levels of death within this cohort. However, in contrast to our hypothesis, there was no significant difference in the survival of the CCR2 knockout mice versus their wild type counterparts. In fact, there was a trend towards slightly improved survival. Second method was to use adoptive transfer. We injected three million monocytes into the peritoneal cavity. And again, this did not impact animal survival. So based on these data, we formulated a second hypothesis that maybe it wasn't merely increased numbers of monocytes, but instead, the infiltration of different types of monocytes that were aiding sepsis survival. So we decided to delve further into the phenotype of these monocytes. Just want to give you a quick overview about hematopoiesis. Of course, you know that within the bone marrow, hematopoietic stem cells divide and give rise to a balanced mix of lymphocytes and myeloid cells. And in the context of a condition like sepsis or trauma, the body goes into emergency myelopoiesis. So the replication, the um, division of the hematopoietic stem cells is increased and the balance is shifted to generate more myeloid cells at the expense of generating fewer lymphocytes. And additionally, immature myeloid cells begin to leave the bone marrow, and some of these have the capacity to act as myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So we wanted to see if maybe there was a difference in monocyte maturity between these two groups. And indeed, um, we looked at CD31, which is a marker of immature monocytes, you can see that the animals predicted to survive sepsis had more of these immature CD31 positive monocytes in their peritoneal cavity. However, when you look at the CD31 negative mature monocytes, the numbers were similar. And then we also looked, we wanted to see more about these CD31 positive cells. We stained for the marker CXCR4 and found that the CD31 positive immature monocytes had higher expression of CXCR4. And this phenotype of being CD31 positive, CXCR4 high, identifies these cells as the transitional premonocyte, which is the immediate precursor of the monocyte, 
which before this study had only been shown to exist in the bone marrow, but it seems like they're coming out to the peritoneal cavity in the context of the subdominal sepsis model. And additionally, these immature monocytes showed greater expression of arginase 1. This is intracellular arginase 1. And um, this is an enzyme that is associated with myeloid-derived suppressor cells. So it seems these could be acting perhaps as myeloid-derived suppressor cells, though. We need to do more research on that. So finally, we want to see their functional consequence on sepsis. And we treated animals with AMD3100. This is a chemical inhibitor of the CXCR4, CXCL12 axis. And you can see on the left-hand side, the treatment with this drug um, resulted in fewer of these CD31 positive immature monocytes being recruited to the peritoneal cavity um, in comparison to animals treated with the PBS vehicle. And then additionally, treatment with this AMD3100 inhibitor actually worsened sepsis survival. So these data suggest that these immature monocytes coming into the peritoneal cavity are playing a protective role during sepsis. So in conclusion, we found that myeloid cells shift dramatically after CLP sepsis, as well as a sterile sham surgery. We see loss of LPM. We see infiltration of monocytes. However, these don't seem to rapidly differentiate into SPM, unlike other models of um, abdominal inflammation. We saw increased numbers of monocytes, and specifically these CD31 positive immature monocytes in the abdomen of animals predicted to survive sepsis. And it seems like trafficking of these immature cells to the peritoneum via the CXCR4, CXCL12 axis promotes sepsis survival. So I want to end by thanking the people that have contributed to this study. Um, I work at TTUHSC El Paso. Um, it's a minority serving institution and many of the um, students in our graduate program there, the master's students, played a key role in the study. So it goes to show how they can do a great job in contributing to research. Um, and I also want to, again, thank the um, SCCM Society for this Wheel Award that I was awarded in 2019. Thank you all for listening. And um, if there's any time at the end, I would be glad to take questions. Thank you. Oh, I want to mention one other thing. I'm so sorry. The data from this also, um, although it's not on the same topic, played a key role as feasibility data that I was able to obtain an R15 grant from the NIH. That's another um, great thing that the SCCM Award helped me do. Thank you so much. Fantastic work, Dr. Walker. Thanks for sharing the follow-up from the 2019 award. I'd like to welcome Dr. Jacob Brenner um, to present um, his um, SCCM Weill Research Grant uh, Award project, the nanoscale drug carriers targeted to alveolar marginated neutrophils for the treatment of ARDS. Welcome. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm an intensivist and bioengineer, actually, so a little uh, different than a lot in the audience here, um, being bioengineer. And uh, so I'm going to be a little broader than my uh, uh, grant label, just to give you guys a, an idea of this field, which might be a little less familiar. Um, so uh, as a bioengineer, I have lots of companies I work with and companies that spin out of my uh, group, so um, uh, believe what you will. Um, so uh, nanomedicine, so what is that? Uh, so that's our, my field. Um, so what that is is simply the use of nanoscale carriers or nanocarriers to deliver cargo therapeutics to their desired location, cell type, organ, et cetera, uh, or change their pharmacokinetics. And so what we're talking about generally is things on about a 100 nanometer scale. Um, so that's the same size as viruses. And so these have been around uh, since the first approval in 1990 of ambisome. So many of us have used that in the ICU. Um, and you can put small molecule drugs into these. Um, and then more recently, the more famous ones uh, in this era are lipid nanoparticles that can deliver nucleic acids, particularly RNA, uh, such as we're in the COVID vaccine. And it's very similar to a liposome, just a slightly uh, more complicated internal structure. And what my lab does is we take these nanocarriers, these particular two, because they're translationally uh, applicable and uh, validated, and we put in small molecule drugs or uh, mRNA or siRNA, so we can increase or decrease any protein of interest. And the goal is that we're going to target them using various uh, tricks on the surface, such as um, antibodies or fragments thereof, and we can get them to go to the places in the body that we want them to. 
And so the question to you guys would be, can nanomedicine solve the pharmacological challenges of acute critical illness? Because we have had very few uh, drugs in our field. And so why is that? Well, I, I, as a pharmacologist and chemical engineering background, the way I look at it is that we have these pharmacological challenges that are fairly unique to our set of diseases, and I'm hoping that nanomedicine can be one of the solutions. So what are those pharmacological challenges? The first is that our patients are very fragile with multi-system organ failure generally, and so they cannot tolerate off-target drug side effects. So so from a pharmacology perspective, we'd say that they have a narrower therapeutic index for nearly every drug than other patient populations. So how could we solve that? Well, we want to deliver drugs solely to that target organ so we don't get off-target side effects. Um, another challenge in our set of diseases is that the, the underlying signaling pathways are not only complex like you get in cancer or asthma, but unique to us is that our um, diseases are very rapidly progressive and any signaling pathway that you look at is going to have its nodes changing on a time course of minutes to hours rather than months to years like those other diseases. And so to solve that, we probably can't just go after a single target, a single protein, because uh, it's, we might be wrong in a single patient about where their protein is at in in terms of its activation state. So the solution to that is multiple drugs. Now, of course, that could lead to polypharmacy unless you are delivering solely to the target organ. And then lastly, um, and something that I think is a little less obvious, is that I would argue that most of our major killers in the ICU are vascular-oriented diseases, but uh, drugs don't go there. So what do I mean by vascular-oriented? So uh, ARDS is a good example. In this, we have the um, microvasculature, the capillaries of the endothelium, uh, of the alveolus, uh, they open up with um, openings between the endothelial cells, and this lets in toxic plasma proteins like complement, and also um, in toxic white blood cells and immune cells. And this same thing happens in stroke. After we pull out a clot with endovascular thrombectomy, the capillaries downstream have this same pathophysiology. And then in, of course, sepsis, it's happening in all of our organs all at once. So we need some way of getting our drugs not just to the target organ, but to the uh, microvasculature. And so that has to be part of our solution, and that's what it is. And so in my lab, what we do is we target nanocarriers, like I just showed you, specifically to the microvasculature of our organs of interest. So to the endothelium, to the marginated neutrophils, and uh, more recently, monocytes. So uh, I'll tell you two really quick stories about nanomedicine to battle acute critical illnesses. Uh, first, ARDS, which is what I got the grant for, um, and then one about stroke. So um, uh, we've published, uh, you know, using the grant from uh, SCCM Weill, we published uh, about three papers this past year in um, uh, journals including Nature Nanotechnology, and I'll be telling you about this paper here, and that's what um, uh, the Weill Foundation funded and got us to an R01. Um, so, uh, what we have is our goal, um, like I said, is to target our nanocarriers to the endothelial cells or some of the other immune cells that are involved um, in the microvasculature, and in particular, uh, marginated neutrophils. So these are neutrophils that live uh, as the dynamic pool within the capillaries of our lungs. And in fact, right now, all of us have about 75% of our body's neutrophils in our lungs in this marginated state. And then in ARDS, they become activated and do all kinds of bad stuff, like re release reactive oxygen species, proteases, et cetera. So we wanted to target them, and so we did a screen where we took our nanocarriers and we injected them into a mouse, a, a pretty weak mouse model of um, sepsis, and then we tried this in ARDS models as well, many different models, six models total. Um, and uh, we screened for uh, nanocarrier uh, moieties on the surface that would target them to these marginated neutrophils. And as our in vivo screen, we gave it to IV LPS mice that are known to have a lot of um, activated marginated neutrophils in their lungs, and we looked for ones that had high uptake in the lungs, and we found this particular targeting moiety here. And you can see that compared to controls, we get very strong uptake in the lungs. And then if you compare, when we give this to a normal, uh, naive mouse, we don't get any uptake of the nanocarriers in the lungs, whereas in an IV LPS mouse in SPECT CT imaging, you can see we get very strong uptake there. Uh, and we, again, validated this in multiple animal models. And we showed that this is indeed going to the marginated neutrophils, as shown on in vivo histology. And then in flow cytometry, we showed that the vast majority of our nanocarriers are taken up by marginated neutrophils, and the rest are taken up by marginated monocytes. We then went on to show that these neutrophil tropic nanocarriers target marginated leukocytes even in ex vivo human lungs. So good validation that this mechanism could work in humans. 
And then we wanted to um, see if we could fix some of these mouse models of ARDS. And so what we did is we, uh, in this case, uh, in the published paper, used uh, nebulized LPS as our mouse model, a pretty high dose to achieve um, some uh, fairly significant injury in the lungs. And um, uh, what we found was we started putting anti-inflammatory drugs into our nanocarriers that were neutrophil tropic, um, but we were quite surprised to find that we didn't even need the drugs in there. Just the nanocarriers by themselves, when they're taken up by these marginated neutrophils, um, acted very well to ameliorate ARDS-like phenotypes, like uh, protein leakage into the lung and alveolar, alveolar uh, leukocyte count. Um, and this is just showing the um, dose response curves, and we have doses that are well within the doses that are used clinically for um, other liposomes. And uh, we went on to show the mechanism of this is that when the nanocarriers are taken up by marginated neutrophils in the lungs, it causes them to demarginate. They could then go to the spleen where they senesce. And if you want to read more about the mechanism, it's in our Nature Nanotechnology paper. So um, then I'll, I was telling you about one cell type that we're going after, uh, marginated leukocytes. Uh, now another one that's a very simple story is going after this in stroke, um, where we go after the endothelium. So in stroke, uh, after we uh, do an endovascular thrombectomy, we then have the problem that the downstream capillaries are very leaky, and this allows in toxic proteins, complement, and innate immune cells, monocytes like Wendy told us about. And so we wanted to stop that, and one way you can stop that is you can close the gates. And so we targeted our nanocarriers to the endothelium, and uh, the way we did that is we found a marker that is upregulated, known already before us, to be upregulated on the surface of endothelial cells in the brain after um, inflammation and stroke, uh, VCAM it's called, and we target our nanocarriers to that. And using this, we can increase the concentration of drugs delivered, free drugs, these are small molecule drugs delivered to the brain by about 200 fold. And we beat prior targeting technologies by about six fold. So um, does this work? Um, so what we did is we then took um, a bunch of um, therapeutics um, from this, uh, this is the most cited review in preclinical stroke, uh, looking at all the different uh, drugs that have been tested. We took those neuroprotective drugs, we put them into nanocarriers, we tested them in a high throughput model first, and then we went on to the gold standard TMCAO model of stroke. And what you can see here is that it worked. Um, I can't tell you the identity of the drugs um, for IP reasons right now, um, but we have a small molecule drug and an mRNA that both significantly decrease stroke volume and they both uh, significantly increase survival at three days. And we can load these both into the same nanocarrier and that's what we're doing next. So uh, in summary, I'd like to hope that I convinced you guys that um, nanomedicine might be a potential future for a lot of diseases of the ICU. Um, it certainly matches the pharmacological challenges of acute critical, il critical illnesses. We can target nanocarriers to particular microvascular beds and particular cells within those beds. Um, and in particular, what we're good at in my lab is that we can target endothelial cells and neutrophils and then also marginated monocytes. Um, and car for cargo drugs, if you guys are interested, what we can do is pretty much any mRNA or siRNA. And for small molecule drugs, we can do about 40% of drugs. It depends on, you know, some chemical details, and this is generally much harder to do. But um, all of this uh, is what I would consider quite ripe for uh, collaboration and would love to do so with any of you or your colleagues. And so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, my lab, which has been really great. My lab's about four and a half years old now. Um, uh, but these people are much older than that. Um, and uh, some of my collaborators, um, for time, I won't go into all of them, but they're really great people. And I'd like to thank, in particular, the SCCM Wild Grant, um, which was uh, one of my first grants I got after my K and has led to a lot of other grants that I've been uh, very fortunate with, um, including uh, working with a lot of companies. So thanks very much, and I will now answer uh, any questions and potential collaboration opportunities.